All right. Well, what I'm going to be talking about is a comparison between entropy inequalities and linear rank inequalities. OK, which, well, I'm sure you all recognize the first one by now. But the second one, if, if you don't, they're the inequalities which hold of where if you're given a certain number of subspaces of a vector space and you uh, determine the dimensions of those subspaces and of the joins of those subspaces, if you take the union and span it to get a bigger subspace, well, you compare all those values and see what inequalities you can get out of them. Well, if I describe it in that way, it doesn't sound like it's much related to this. But in fact, uh, the two are quite closely related. In fact, every, uh, OK, I, I always get this backwards if I don't say it very carefully. It turns out any entropy inequality is a linear rank inequality. Uh, but in order to explain that, I'd better say what these inequalities are bounds on. Well, any entropy inequalities are bound on entropic uh, vectors or polymatroids. Uh, it doesn't matter which, which word I use here because the polymatroid is just one is a, just a vector that satisfies the Shannon inequalities, and those are a necessary prerequisite for being entropic anyway. OK. While the linear rank inequalities bound the representable, I guess it's normal to use the word polymatroids here. And so if you want to prove that every linear rank, uh, every entropy inequality is a linear rank inequality, what you end up you do, doing is showing that every representable polymatroid is an entropic polymatroid. So what is it? OK, it's, OK, if you're given a list of subspaces A, B, uh, and so on, of a, of a larger vector space V, well, then you list the values dimension of, well, let's start the dimension of nothing, the dimension of A, dimension of B, a dimension of A plus B, the, the space spanned by both of them, uh, and so on. And you ask what linear inequalities have to hold among this sequence of values. Then Just like, mm -hmm. any set, uh, uh, it should be the same thing. Or, uh, or, oh, 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 no, I'm sorry. Yeah, A and B are not assumed to be disjoint or, or, or orthogonal or anything. So it's, so I get, it's not a direct sum. It's just the, yes. So if it's better, do you just use a plus then? OK. And in fact, that's the, the key point here, that the, this dimension might be less than the sum of these two dimensions. OK. Well, OK. And I guess well, I might as well, uh, I can normally assume V is, is a finite, uh, is a vector space over a finite field. So, so if I take, well, what I want to do is take the, uh, each of these subspaces and produce a corresponding random variable such that the entropies of the random variables correspond to the dimensions of the subspaces. And usually it takes a couple of tries to get this right because you have to go to a dual space to do it. But the way you do it is to take let f be 
a random linear function from V to, to the field, let's say it's F sub Q is the field we're taking the, sub, the vector spaces over, and let F sub A be just F restricted to A, and F sub B be F restricted to B, and so on. And each of these is now a random variable, and the entropy of this random variable, uh, oh, well, I should have said random chosen uniformly. Okay, so, that, so it turns out that F sub A is chosen uniformly over all functions from A to the field, and so the entropy of this random variable is going to be uh, just the dimension of A times, I guess, the log of Q. And if you're just going to choose the same log for your entropies as for the same as the, as the logarithms of base Q, then you don't have to worry about that. But otherwise, let's just toss it in. So, so in any case, from, from this representable polymetroid here, we've gotten maybe a constant multiple, which is an entropic vector. Okay, so okay, and that constant multiple brings me to this next quest. Okay, namely these entropic vectors are representable matroids. Basically, form a convex cone. Uh, well, for entropic vectors, the answer is yes. They do basically form a convex cone. All you, all you have to do is take a closure. Uh, well, the representable polymatroids, well, first of all, the way I've defined representable polymatroids, they all have to be integer valued, so clearly they don't form a cone. But if we toss in con uh, scalar multiples of them as well, then well, should they form a, a convex cone? Turns out, not quite. Uh, only if we fix the, f the field size. Or field characteristic. Okay. Because the, the normal way of, of getting the, the additive property, well, with random variables, you just take, if you've got one set of random variables for this entropy vector and another set for this vector, you just take an independent copy of this and this. And you expect to do the same thing with the representable polymatroids. If you've got one collection of subspaces that represent this one and another collection of subspaces which represent this vector, well, then to combine the two vectors, you're just supposed to take the direct sum of these two things. But that doesn't work unless you're working over the same field. Uh, actually, it's close enough to be working over the fields of the same characteristic because, uh, because if you've got a representable vector over fp to the n, you can get a represent, re representation over f to the p just by taking uh, viewing each member of P to the N as an n-dimensional n vector over P. Okay, so it's really only the characteristic that matters. But as I will say more about later, the characteristic indeed does matter. Okay, well, anyway, since, since I've tossed in the word polymatroids, I'm uh, certainly uh, throwing in the Shannon uh, inequalities to start with, and, and the Shannon inequalities certainly do apply to these things, but there are non Shannon. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, but there are now many known non-Shannon examples. And, well, the first example of this on the entropy side was the Zhang Young inequality, which is 1998. Well, the first example on the linear rank inequality side actually came a lot earlier. It was due to Ingleton in 1971. And let me just go ahead and write down what the inequalities are. Uh, let's see. And the one for Ingleton is a little bit shorter. Okay, and okay, you'll note not only is that this one shorter, but that this one actually is obtained from this one by just crossing out a few terms or crossing out one coefficient and two terms. In other words, the Ingleton inequality implies the Xiangyang inequality. And that's no accident. It turns out that the Ingleton inequality implies all non-Shannon inequalities on four variables. For, well, I'll explain more about that in a moment. Okay, well, so next the number of variables not yet understood. Okay, well, or not yet understood fully, we know a lot about them. Okay, for entropy inequalities, this is four, we've seen them quite a bit about that, uh, certainly this morning. And for three variables, it's just the Shannon inequalities, and that's it. Since I'm not going to worry about boundary effects, I'm just taking the closure. But for four variables, there's a lot going on. And in particular, Matusch's result that you can't describe this with only finitely many inequalities. You need infinitely many. Okay. For linear rank inequalities, it turns out that the number here is six because for four variables, okay, it's all you need to know are Shannon and an Ingleton. Uh, those are sufficient to describe the entire cone of representable polymatroids. That's a result of, uh, I'll try that. And, okay, for five variables, it turns out that the list consists of Shannon, uh, four instances of Ingleton, uh, because you can uh, plot, uh, if you've got five variables, you can plug in combinations of some of them to get into the four variables of Ingleton. And 24, I believe, other inequalities. Okay. So, 
so, so the, the four and five variable ones are, are known. And for six variables, uh, well, there's a long list and it's not yet known in, in full detail. Again, I'll say more about that later. Okay. Uh, okay. By the way, when you're understanding the, the, these convex cones, there are two ways to do it. There's the outer method of looking at the inequalities which bound them or the inner method of looking at the points within the cones and trying to generate the cone from them. Or, well, since we're talking about cones, uh, any point in the cone actually generates a ray in the cone. So, so we'll talk about the rays generating the cone. And in particular, if you want to understand uh, the cone, either you can make a uh, somehow complete list of the inequalities which bounds it, or make a list of the extreme rays in the cone from which you can generate all the other rays. Now, I guess if you fully wanted to understand it, you'd have both of those descriptions. Okay. So, I guess I want to talk now about how these inequalities or, or extreme rays can be generated. And here's what I think is one of the main differences between two, these two situations. And I'll phrase it this way. The attitude towards candidate rays or inequalities And for en entropy inequalities, the attitude is pessimism. And for linear rank inequalities, the attitude is optimism. OK, now this doesn't say anything about whether I think we're going to solve the problems or, or whether I think we can generate these things. What I mean by this is, suppose I take all the inequalities so far that, that I know about and, say, use some software to generate from those a list of extreme rays of, of this putative region I got from the known inequalities. Now, if I take one of these extreme rays, do I think it's actually going to be in the cone? Well, for entropy inequalities, it, it seems to be the answer is, no, I do not expect that to be at the cone. And in fact, uh, it's a rather extreme situation, I think, that except for a very short list of, any, of extreme rays given from the Shannon inequalities, uh, I don't think any explicit example of an extreme ray of this cone is known. Is, is that correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if I take an extreme ray from that and try to come up with an entropic representation of it, I don't expect that to work. That, that does not mean, though, that I can't do anything with it because I can take that vector and try to prove that it's not entropic by using one of these Okay, by one of the, using one of these methods of uh, the Zhang Young copy variable method or, or one of the improvements uh, that Laszlo mentioned later. And, okay, just toss in the inequalities obtained from that combined with the values of my putative vector and see if I can get a contradiction out of whatever linear programming software I want to use. And if I do, then I can probably piece together a new uh, entropy inequality. OK. Well, f 
for linear rank inequalities, it, it's not so bad a situation. If you uh, take the known inequalities and generate a bunch of extreme rays, a lot of them do turn out to be representable. Okay. Which, by the way, it takes me now to methods of proof for these things. Uh, okay, well, I guess that's one fortunate thing about the pessimism over here, because even if I did have an extreme ray and I did think it was an entropy, an entropic vector, I wouldn't have any idea of coming up how to come up with a probability distribution for it. That's, uh, that seems to be a very tricky problem. On the other hand, if we're looking at uh, the uh, linear rank inequalities, I come up with this vector uh, of, of, well, let's say integer values, and I want to know whether these integer values are the dimensions of a properly chosen set of subspaces of a vector space. Well, again, there, it, it may not be easy in, uh, to just look at it and see that, it, that there is such a representation. But, but we have, in fact, come up with uh, some methods that have turned out to be quite productive for proving such things. OK, so for instance, uh, OK, well, this is a, a rather simple example of a, of a, a polymatroid on four variables. So this is dimension of A, dimension of B, the dimension of A, B together, and so on. And it's what you would get by just taking four independent one-dimensional subspaces, except for this, this entry at the end. And so it's not that hard to uh, come up with a, uh, a set of vector spaces which represents this, but, but I want to mention one particular way of coming up with such. Namely, okay, what we do is just start with some large vector space over whatever field I want to. I would prefer to make it a field over a large, uh, a field of large size for reasons I'll get to in a moment. And let's say A is just one random vector. from this large subspace. And B just is just given by one random vector. And if I do it this way, then if I take B as a random vector, the probability that it'll be dependent on A is going to be very low. I'm, I'm taking this large subspace over a large field. I mean, so if uh, so if, if the field size is Q, then no matter what the dimension is, as long as it's bigger than 1, the probability that this will be dependent on this is at most 1 over Q. Okay, and then C is one random vector. And D is one random vector from... Okay, not from the whole space, but from A plus B plus C. Because if I do it this way, then I'm enforcing the fact that this one vector is dependent. 
But if I choose it randomly, then again, if Q is large, the probability that something is going to go wrong and I get an accidental dependence somewhere else is very small. So, so if I specify my subspaces this way, it's going to give a representation of this vector over any sufficiently large uh, field. And OK, it turns out if I do it this way, it works over any field. But at least, uh, OK, if I do a, a longer represent, OK, other cases, may, that may not be true. It may be only over fields of size at least three. But it will certainly work if the field is large enough. OK, well, or I could make this example a little more complicated by lengthening it to a five. OK, so let me lengthen this by putting in a fifth variable with these values. Uh, uh, no, I'm, I'm extending the vector. Okay, they, these are the, the, the 16 new values to make a 32 length vector. Yeah, I just... Uh, I'm sorry, what? Uh, if there isn't a single one, this E is going to be a subspace of dimension 2. Okay. But to get the representation, I've got to do something a little more tricky here. Namely, E will contain one random vector from the following subspace, A plus B intersect C plus D, and one random vector from C. Okay, now I'm <laughs> not going to say that it's at all obvious that this works, but it turns out that if you prove enough linear algebra lemmas, you can show that if you choose the vectors for me this way, you will end up getting this particular uh, uh, polymatroid out of it. OK, well, it turns out that, th that looking for representations of this form succeeds an awful lot of the time. And namely, we've gone through uh, lists of millions of these uh, polymatroids to try to determine whether they're representable or not. Well, proving that they're not representable, the best way is to come up with a linear rank inequality that they violate. But proving that they are representable, uh, well, we use this method to, well, I don't want to try all possible ways of doing these specifications, but we have a bunch of heuristic methods for looking at uh, the given polymatroid and trying to come up with a possible representation of this form. And just using those heuristic methods and a couple of extensions to them. Well, we've looked at million, OK, we've got a list of 5.5 million six-variable polymatroids, which have been verified uh, representable by this method. And the list of ones for which we've uh, tried a whole bunch of methods of this sort and, and have failed to uh, represent them uh, is now of length uh, 40. So, so this is uh, a very productive method. OK. So anyway, uh, OK, 
Okay. Okay, well, so like I said, this gives uh, 5.5. Uh, extreme rays so far. Uh, uh, yes, correct. Th this is before using the 720 permutations you could get just by rearranging the variables. So uh, 5, uh, 4 billion plus uh, after permutations. Okay, and, and these are known to be extreme rays because they are in fact the intersection of, of the, uh, they were obtained by intersecting, well, let's see, we've got 64 dimensions that we're looking at, but one of them is trivial, There's, so that leaves 63 dimensions, so I need 62 planes to specify a ray. And each of these extreme rays is, in fact, satisfying exactly, exactly 62 independent linear rank inequalities. So they really are extreme rays of the cone. OK. And I should mention what we've got on the inequality side. Okay, we've got over three million plus, uh, or two billion after permuting. And, and again, the, this list of inequalities does not include any we're going to throw away later because they turned out to be redundant. These are all uh, known to be sharp inequalities. I, I, I should say a little bit about what sharp means here because it's a, a word that's been applied to inequalities with a lot of context and possibly a little vaguely. But I would want to say that in the context of bounding planes for a convex cone, well, a sharp inequality is one that cannot be obtained as a, a non-negative combination of other bounding inequalities. So, so in a case of uh, a rounded surface, uh, a bit, well, a bounding plane just might touch in one point or ray, but in terms of a more polyhedral surface, uh, the sharp inequality might give an entire face of the cone. Now, for the entropy inequalities, there, there aren't known to be any of, any of these sharp in the stronger sense ones, except for the elemental Shannon inequalities which are known to actually give faces of the cone. But on the linear rank side, all of these inequalities have been verified to be sharp in the sense that there are 62 independent representable uh, polymatroids lying on them. So they really are needed in any description of the cone. Okay. Well, I, I have described how we, we can get new extreme rays. How do I get, how do we get all these new uh, inequalities? Okay. Well, okay. Well, I was going to say that the main method of proving inequalities 
that's been most productive on the entropy side was by copy variables. Okay, but after this morning, I probably should extend this to, well, maximum entropy methods and so on. And, okay, for the linear rank inequalities, the, the corresponding, well, I'll say corresponding, but th there, there are a number of similarities, but they're not completely the same, is the use of common informations. Okay. Now, now just like for uh, the copy variable method for verifying entropy inequalities, this is basically a just a linear programming problem. You uh, write down the Okay, uh, okay, you can write down the copy, the specifications of the copy variables, the uh, independent specifications and the uh, matching up of marginal distributions, and then feed that together with, uh, uh, as, as preconditions into uh, something like ITIP and, and try to prove the copy inequality. Now, for common informations, okay, it, it's the same sort of specifications you can put in. So, I guess I'd like to, to look at the example of the in Ingleton inequality, which we saw this morning, and, and say a little bit more about it. Okay, well, here's the inequality. And here's how we would prove it using a common information Z for the variables A and B, by which I mean that H of Z given A is zero, H of Z given B is zero, but H of Z is just the mutual information of A and B. Well, so let me draw a tree with nodes, some of these terms. I of C and D. I have A and B given C. I have A and B given D. Just this small tree here. The point being that each variable that occurs as one of the two side terms in this mutual information occurs as the condition in this conditional mutual information. And the nodes at the leaves of this tree don't have further subnodes because the variables are the two variables A and B that I've mentioned over here. Now the point of this is that there's a certain Shannon inequality that if I take I of, well, let's say R and S given T, and I add on H of Z given R, then what I get is greater than or equal to I of Z and S given T. This is just a, a, a easily verified Shannon inequality that states that I can substitute Z for R in this uh, conditional mutual information at a cost of adding on H of Z given R. And of course, I could do the same thing on the S side if I wanted. Okay, so given this tree here, well, let me tack on a couple more uh, terms down here. H of Z given A, H of Z given B, H of Z given A, H of Z given B, 
which I'm assuming are zero anyway, so it won't hurt it to add them on. But if I do this, then I look at h of z given a, and I add it to this term here, it's greater than or equal to what I would have gotten by plugging in z for the a. So, so the sum of the terms in this tree is greater than or equal to the sum of the terms in the modified tree. And let's do the same modification on this side. OK, well, but now what I've got is i of z and z given c, which is h of z given c, which lets me move up to the next level of the tree. And I can now substitute a z up here. And I can do the same thing over on this side. h of z given a lets me ch change that a to a z. h of z given b lets me choose that b to a z. And now I've got h of z given d, which lets me change this d to a z. So what I've ended up proving is that I of A and B given C plus I of A and B given D plus I of C and D plus some other things I tacked on at the bottom, which were all 0, is greater than or equal to what I ended up with here, which is H of Z. But that, I'm assuming, is equal to I of A and B. So we end up with the Ingleton inequality. OK, well, well now that you've seen that argument, I think uh, you'll agree that it generalizes quite a bit, namely, any tree I drew of this sort, which starts at the top with an with a mutual information without condition, and each time a variable or combination of variables other than the two over here appears, I have to put down a child node with that as its condition. And if I create a tree like that, then I can conclude that the sum of all the terms in the tree is greater than or equal to this particular mutual information over here. And it turns out there's an extension of this method with some uh, non-tree edges to use an extra trick. But it turns out that there are many, well, you could write down infinitely many inequalities this way. And well, the problem is that not all of them would be sharp. But, but what it turns out is that all the known inequalities which were proved with one common information variable can, in fact, give, be given a pictorial proof of this sort. But it turns out that it's probably not best to try generating them all this way, because you write down a tree like this, and you get a corresponding inequality. There's no way to tell in advance whether it's even non-Shannon, let alone sharp. OK, so, so the computation methods tend to go back to generating these candidate rays and inequalities. Well, I mentioned how you gener generate a ray from the known inequalities by taking an extreme ray. Well, you can do the same thing in the other direction. You take all your known extreme rays and try to uh, just find the faces of the cone generated by those. Well, in the pessimistic case, you don't expect to get an inequality on the entropy side. But in the optimistic linear rank case, you, you do often get inequalities that can be proved by, well, trying to specify some common informations. However, we have a lot more unresolved ones in that case. This, this method is not quite as productive. OK, but well, I think it's 
time to reach a conclusion here, namely, what, what are the open, uh, well, let me just say the big question. Uh, well, what, what I think uh, is the big question over on the entropy side, well, there are a lot of questions still about the four variable region. It, but, but what I, okay, I think this question actually came up in the discussion at the end this morning, namely, what's the dimension of the set of extreme rays? Now, if the cone were polyhedral, there would only be finitely many extreme rays, so I'd be talking about a one-dimensional set. Uh, if, in, in the other extreme, if, if the cone is actually smooth surfaced with a, a curved surface, then I believe we're talking about a 14-dimensional set of extreme rays. But it's not at all clear that either of those is the correct answer. It's quite possible that there's something in between. Like you might, for instance, have a three-dimensional set of examples, just like from the ringing bells points, and ask whether those somehow gave uh, a part of the extreme rays of the uh, uh, entropy cone. Okay, but on the other side, well here, clearly the main question is, is it polyhedral? Because that's, uh, we just don't know whether there are finitely many of them. And there's no obvious reason to say that it is because the common information approach, like the copy variable approach, may involve large numbers of, okay, when I say common informations, I don't just have to take common informations of things I started with. I can take com some common informations to get new variables and then have new common informations involving those new variables. So it's not just a finite list here to try. So it's quite possible that this does not work out to be polyhedral. Actually, I should mention one question that, that applies to both of these cases, namely, is the main method we're using good enough? I mean, you saw that picture that, that Laszlo presented in the morning where the inner bound of this three-dimensional object and the outer bound obtained from the known inequalities seem to be very far separated. And I don't think that was due to a lack of computation. There's been a lot of computation going on there. So the question is, even if you computed forever, uh, would the inequalities you get from the known method actually come down and meet the lower bounds from uh, actual examples or or is there some gap there that has to be surmounted by coming up with a new method of proving inequalities? And that you can ask exactly the same uh, question on the linear rank inequality side. And there, I think you can, uh, but there I think there is a definite reason to say that the answer is yes, we need other methods. And the reason it comes back to this question of dependence on the field size. Because one thing about this proof using common informations, common informations just don't depend on the field size. They're, they exist for over any field. So, so if you've got a, a linear rank inequality that works for characteristic two but doesn't work for characteristic three, you're certainly not going to be able to prove it that it works for characteristic two using common informations. There's got to be some other method. Now, there are known examples of this. Uh, I believe the first published ones were due to, I, uh, 
okay, due to uh, Blasiak, Kleinberg, and Lubetsky, namely, okay, there are, okay, they come from the, the Fano matroid and the non-Fano matroid. The Fano matroid is representable over even fields but not over odd fields. And the non-Fano is representable over odd fields but not even fields. And, in, and you can check that in each case, not only there are they not representable, they lie outside the corresponding cone, which means that you can separate them from the cone by a linear rank inequality. And and they actually worked out the linear rank inequality, uh, conditional linear rank inequalities on seven variables, one which only works for characteristic two and one which only works for odd characteristic. And later, uh, I and my co-authors have uh, produced other such examples. And well, the, the methods using for proving those things, you got to go back to the basics so far, either just look using direct reasoning on vector spaces or reasoning on the functions between vector spaces, which means writing down a lot of matrices and so on. And that's, well, the sharper the inequality, the uglier the proof is <laughs> the way that looks there. You, you get real messes if you want, want accurate inequalities. So I think there's a lot to be done there on in, on coming up with other methods for proving those, just like the copy variable or common information variables clean things up. Okay, so I think that's all I want to say at this point. Mm -hmm.